Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, welcome uh, to the Ganaki uh, Lecture Theatre, a wonderful um, part of the refurbished uh, uh, um, medical school and, and, and really further enhancing our fantastic reputation that our university uh, and Nangwell's Hospital has for uh, medical education. But we're here today for a very special uh, lecture um, uh, to celebrate the successful completion uh, of the latest fundraising appeal by the University of Dundee and Ninewells uh, Cancer Campaign. Let me tell you a little bit about um, the Ninewells Cancer Campaign. Um, it was created as long ago as 1991 following a successful one-off campaign to raise funds for a CT scanner for Ninewells uh, Hospital. And the formal uh, launch was originally to raise a million pounds to establish the University of Dundee Biomedical Research Centre. And that was to be a major new research department um, in the university's medical school under the direction of Professor Roland Wolfe. And of course, um, many of you will know Roland and the wonderful work that he and his team have done uh, and the great um, uh, contribution that Roland has made to the, uh, the reputation uh, of uh, our medical school um, in, uh, in cancer research. And the campaign, Nymol's Cancer Campaign, was led for many years uh, by Dr. Pat McPherson, a great friend uh, to many of us, uh, and uh, Jackie Wood. Um, <coughs> uh, Jackie acted as chair from its formation until her very untimely death from ovarian cancer in May 2011. And from that first campaign, a modest campaign as it turns out, it didn't seem modest at the time, um, it has raised astonishingly more than £20 million with support provided for many ambitious projects and they include the Princess Alexandra Cancer Treatment Centre, the Department of Surgery and Molecular Oncology, the Pat McPherson Centre for Pharmacogenomics and Pharmacogenetics, together with support for research into personalised cancer medicine and the provision of specialised medical and surgical equipment. And the latest £2 million appeal um, has been in memory of Dr Jackie Wood. She's Dr Wood, of course, or she was Dr Wood, uh, because um, the university uh, made her an honorary uh, graduate um, uh, se several years ago. Uh, and um, uh, that was in itself a truly wonderful occasion celebrating uh, Jackie's uh, many uh, achievements and cementing, I think, the relationship between Jackie uh, and, uh, and the university. Um, the, the Jackie Wood Cancer Centre has been established on the Nine Wells Hospital campus uh, <coughs> and it supports a recruitment of key cancer scientists, including uh, today's uh, lecturer, uh, Professor Russell Petty, and his uh, research team. And the Jackie Wood Centre is home to the University of Dundee Division of Cancer Research, which has brought together more than 150 research scientists working closely with clinicians to improve the understanding of cancer and translate research findings into improved treatments. And we've just had a few photographs um, here uh, earlier on uh, with the sort of formal presentation of the, the check which makes the final contribution to that £2 million appeal. And it might seem like a small figure. That was for £2,357, which is very typical of the kinds of generous donations and the enthusiasm and commitment that local people in Dundee and in uh, the region uh, uh, have been making uh, since 1991 to this fantastic appeal. It's actually um, the final component of more than £6,000 uh, raised by uh, Robin West, um, in the Montrose area, putting on all sorts of events uh, to raise money uh, to support this great campaign. And I think that almost is very much, seems to me, to be very much the heart and spirit of the Nine Worlds Can Cancer Campaign and what it has achieved. So that uh, was great to be, to be photographed uh, with the cheque and with Robin uh, earlier on. I didn't introduce myself, I've just realised. I am, <laughs> if I can remember... Uh, I'm Pete Downs, I'm the, uh, the principal of, of the university and very proud to be here uh, today and also a member of, uh, of the, uh, the, the board um, oversees the, uh, the Nine Worlds Cancer Campaign. Uh, <coughs> and um, so today's lecture is by Professor uh, Russell uh, Petty 
Um, he's actually a graduate of, of the School of Medicine here at the University of Dundee, so I think particularly apposite that he gives uh, the lecture today. He did his general medical training in Nine Wills Hospital and then um, at the Royal Hobart Hospital and Newcastle General Hospital and then specialist training in medical oncology in Newcastle, Aberdeen and Auckland. Um, uh, we managed to prize him away um, from um, uh, uh, his time uh, as a, um, in the Department of Pathology at the University of Aberdeen and recruit him here um, to the Chair of Medical um, Oncology uh, where he began um, <coughs> in uh, uh, September 2015. Um, he has many um, external roles in addition to um, <coughs> his role here. He is a medical oncology special, speciality advisor to the Chief Medical Officer in Scotland. He's an advisor to the Scottish Parliament in, on access to cancer medicines and cancer research. And he's a member of the Chief Scientist Office Experimental and Translational Medical Medicine Research um, Committee. Here at um, Nine Wells Hospital, he leads a research program in clinical and translational cancer medicine focused on esophageal and gastric cancer involving laboratory research and early and late phase clinical trials. And these are cancers that are particularly um, difficult um, to treat effectively and one of the reasons why we're very keen to expand and develop uh, research uh, in this area. Uh, and Professor Petty um, has been a great um, if you like, a academic acquisition for the university. He's published more than 80 peer-reviewed scientific papers and book chapters. So I'm going to invite him now uh, to give um, his uh, uh, lecture entitled Achieving the Impossible, Developing New Medicines for Hard-to-Treat Cancers. Russell. Thank you very much, Principal, for your, for your generous uh, welcome, and, and thank you also to the Nine Wells Cancer Campaign for inviting me to deliver this lecture uh, today. Um, I am delighted to be here. I can't operate my slide, so to bear with me. But I'm delighted to be here today, uh, particularly as from this side of the, the podium I can see such a wonderfully diverse audience. It's great to speak to uh, all the, the loyal members and supporters of the Nine Wells Cancer Campaign and I, also my academic colleagues and my clinical colleagues and it's great to see old friends and family amongst the audience as well. So I hope that I will provide something that's of interest and of value uh, to all of you. So sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. These are the words that Lewis Carroll gave to Alice, and these are the words that I've chosen as the inspiration for my lecture today. Because as a cancer doctor, when you're faced with a hard to treat, a patient with a hard to treat cancer, and you're trying to manage the clinical problems that they present with, it can very often seem like you're being asked to achieve the impossible. And indeed, those oncologists such as myself that choose to specialise in these hard-to-treat cancers are often viewed by our other clinical colleagues as being a little mad, uh, maybe a little bad and certainly dangerous to know. Such is the magnitude of the challenge that these patients with hard-to-treat cancers present. And so what I'd like to do in this lecture is discuss with you uh, how I have gone about with my research team and our many collaborators developing a research strategy uh, to address the very real clinical problem of hard to treat cancers. Uh, in many respects, this is a story of hard won, small incremental gains in scientific knowledge, which, when put together, have transformed untreatable medical diseases into treatable and controllable clinical conditions. What I'd also like to do is take this opportunity to reflect with you on the progress that we've made and the challenges that still remain to us. So this is what I'm going to talk about today is translational cancer research. And this is a process of really the transfer of scientific knowledge and understanding from the level of the gene to the level of the protein, which are the products of genes, to the behaviour of cancer cells and ultimately to the level of the behaviour of cancer in a patient. Um, and once you've done this, you have a very detailed understanding of the disease process. And once you have this, this founds the foundation for developing new and effective treatments. As oncologists, we're most interested in proteins because the proteins will be the targets of the medicines that we develop. 
But it would be wrong, it would be incorrect of me to suggest that translational research always processes in this way from the laboratory side to the patient's bedside. Because in reality, investigation flows in both directions. And in particular, observations made by clinicians in the course of treating patients, particularly if they're done in the setting of a clinical trial, can prove invaluable to scientists to allow them to design the correct experiments which will ask the right questions and provide the right answers in terms of the scientific information we need to develop new and effective treatments. So what do I mean about by hard-to-treat cancers? Well, I can illustrate this to you if we take some time and look at this graph of uh, the survival, the five-year survival, essentially the cure rate of a number of the common cancer types in the UK. And we can see that, thankfully, today, for many cancers, the prognosis is very good. So testicular cancer, nearly every patient's cured. Malignant melanoma, again, over 90% of people are cured nearly 90% of patients with breast cancer will be cured. But down at the other end of the table, you can see the outlook really isn't quite as good. And these are the hard-to-treat cancers. So you see here stomach, esophagus, and pancreas. These are cancers of the upper gastrointestinal tract, and these are the cancers that I specialise in treating. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is talk about esophageal cancer, which is my main clinical interest, uh, as an example of a hard-to-treat cancer. So this is the esophagus. It's a metal, it's a, a metal, a muscular tube whose purpose is to get food from the back of your throat to your stomach through the chest. And it does this very efficiently. The esophageal muscle is amongst the most powerful known to nature. And this means that should you wish to do so, uh, it is possible to eat and drink while standing on your head. This is a, a thing that uh, people seem very keen, and animals as well, seem very keen to demonstrate. When cancer of the esophagus arises, it starts on the inner lining of the tube, and as it grows, it eats through the wall of the esophagus. It gets access to these glands, the lymph glands and the bloodstream, and once it's done this, it can spread to just about anywhere in the body. What this means is that uh, esophageal cancer uh, is, is characterised by a tendency to spread very early, usually before patients develop any symptoms. And so at the time of diagnosis, two out of three patients I see in my clinic will have secondary or metastatic spread. And this may be evident uh, as a spread in other organs on scans like this one, or it might be microscopic spread, so below the level of detection on scans, but nevertheless there and something that will cause problems uh, down the line. This is important because what this means is that in order to treat esophageal cancer effectively, we, uh, we need medicines that we can give to patients and that will seek out the cancer cells wherever they might be. Now, I can't see many of my surgical or radiotherapy colleagues, I've seen one uh, in the audience today, but uh, I'm sorry to say, and I say this with the greatest of love and respect, surgery and radiotherapy on its own isn't enough for esophageal cancer. We need medicines as well. So to illustrate this, I thought I would show you a real-life uh, clinical example of the use of medicines in esophageal uh, cancer. Uh, and this is also work that I developed uh, as a, a registrar uh, working in Aberdeen with a series of clinical trials towards the end of the 1990s and into the early 2000s. And I thought that you might like to look, see what I looked like then. There I am, fresh face, keen. Um, these are the people I worked with, Marianne Nicholson, uh, an oncologist in Aberdeen, and Professor David Cunningham from the Royal Marsden Hospital. So what I'm going to ask you to do here is imagine 100 patients with esophageal cancer, and they have scans, they've got no metastasis, no secondary spread, and they have surgery to remove their tumour, and this is potentially curative. And if we wait five years, we'll find that 40 patients are cured, and 60 patients will develop recurrent disease. Now, these patients develop recurrent disease because at the time of diagnosis, they have microscopic spread. We can't see it on scans, but it's there, uh, and it grows up down the line to manifest as recurrent disease. Now, if we give chemotherapy treatment before the surgery and sometimes afterwards as well, then instead of curing 40 patients, we cure 50 patients. So this shows you that uh, ke chemotherapy can add something to surgery, it also shows you that medicines can cure patients with esophageal cancer. But it also importantly shows you that the use of chemotherapy in this disease is very inefficient. As an oncologist, I have to give chemotherapy and all that entails to 100 patients to cure just 10. 
So as a result of this work, now it's very rare for patients with esophageal cancer to go straight to theatre to have surgery to remove their esophageal cancer. More commonly, we give them chemotherapy or sometimes chemotherapy and radiotherapy first. This has become the standard of care and it optimises the chances of, uh, of successful treatment. But despite this, the reality is that the majority of patients after surgery will have recurrent disease, a secondary spread of their cancer, and a fair proportion of patients will present with the secondary spread and therefore surgery or radiotherapy won't be possible uh, in the first place. So for these patients, medicines are the only treatment option. And one of these medicines are the chemotherapy drugs. They're called cytotoxic drugs because they act by killing cells. They selectively kill cancer cells, but they also kill to a small extent other cells in the body as well. Uh, and this means that they do have a wide range of often severe side effects. But they are useful medicines for treating esophageal cancer. And on this slide, I'd just like to take a few moments to reflect on what we've achieved with chemotherapy in uh, metastatic esophageal cancer. So if we go back to the 1980s, before chemotherapy was used, uh, the, this, this was a horrible disease. Um, this is something that I can still recall encountering as a medical student uh, in, in, in Nymal's hospital on the surgical wards. What would happen was that the patient's uh, disease would progress rapidly, their condition uh, would, would fail rapidly, uh, and most patients, unfortunately, would die within just two or three months of being diagnosed. Often the symptoms were very difficult, if not impossible, to control. And in the early 1990s, as I completed my medical studies here, uh, the, we started to see trials that demonstrated that chemotherapy could effectively control the disease in some patients and improve the symptoms. And this led to 20 years of research where a series of clinical trials were performed which combined chemotherapy together and optimised its effectiveness. And this got us to the stage uh, where now, we, when we give chemotherapy to these patients, we control the disease in two out of three patients, we improve their symptoms, and uh, the, having achieved disease control, we can control the disease in the majority of cases for one or two years. So you can see here that really what this work has done is transformed an untreatable disease into a treatable and manageable condition, at least for a while. And when you look at each of these trials results in isolation, they may seem as though they're the small gains. But when put together, and, and each one couldn't have been achieved by the one before it, so when you put them together, they have achieved a lot. Of course, as oncologists, we always want to achieve more for our patients, and recently we have had a key breakthrough. So it's been shown that a targeted drug, drug called Herceptin, when added to chemotherapy, increases the effectiveness of treatment. On average, it controls the disease for between 6 and 12 months longer than chemotherapy would on its own. This is a very meaningful gain for patients with a limited life expectancy. And you can see that in this context, this isn't a small incremental gain. This is a big step forward. So Herceptin is a targeted uh, cancer medicine, and they're different from chemotherapy. They target molecules that are responsible for the continued growth uh, and maintenance of the cancers. They target cancer cells more specifically uh, than chemotherapy, so they have less side effects. They can often be taken as tablets as an outpatient, just as people might take their blood pressure or diabetes tablets. And as I've shown you, they are often more effective than chemotherapy. The first targeted drug, uh, came onto the market in 1995, which was the year I graduated. And since then, we've seen many targeted drugs, and we now have dozens for use in clinical practice. And a large part of my uh, career as a researcher has been involved in undertaking clinical trials uh, of these new targeted drugs. And one thing that became very readily apparent early on was that when we gave these drugs to a patient or a group of patients with a particular type of cancer, only a minority subset of them would respond. So what we realised was that what was needed was a way of picking out those patients that would respond up front and directing the, the therapies towards them. And the way that we've been able to do this is by the development of predictive biomarker tests. So these are tests that are done on a blood sample or a biopsy sample from a patient's tumour uh, and tell us the likelihood that that patient will respond to a particular medicine. So with Herceptin, we use this together with a predictive biomarker because it's only patients that are positive for HER2 um, 
that will benefit from the addition to Hercept or Herceptin to chemotherapy, and this comprises only a 10% group. 90% of the patients will not benefit because they don't have this predictive biomarker test. The test for the uh, predictive biomarker is known as a FISH test, and it measures the numbers of the copy numbers of the gene that codes for the protein that Herceptin targets. So those patients that have lots of copies, the green dots here, are the patients that benefit uh, from Herceptin. So this has allowed us to progress on uh, with the concept of precision cancer medicine. And here what we're aspiring to do is that when patients come to the clinic, uh, we are undertaking a whole series of predictive biomarker tests which will allow us to categorize patients into different subgroups and then individualize the treatment and give them the treatment that is most likely to be successful. And this, in turn, is completely changing the way we approach cancer scientifically. So in the past, we would categorise cancer on the basis of anatomy, uh, where the primary tumour was, which organ, and histology, uh, the way in which the cells looked under the microscope. We now categorise cancer molecularly. So each of the common cancer types are divided into subgroups, and each subgroup has a predictive biomarker which tells you which targeted drugs should be used in that patient subgroup. Many of the targeted drugs we have target the receptors on the surface of cells. And these receptors are known as receptor-tyrosine kinases. Uh, And they play an important role in normal physiology because when they're stimulated, they tell cells to divide or they tell them to move. And this way, uh, cell tissues can protect themselves against damage and maintain the status quo. In many cancers, these receptors, and you can see them here, are, are overstimulated and so the cells divide when they shouldn't do and this forms tumour masses and they move when they shouldn't do and this means the cancers can spread about the body. Um, and Herceptin that I've told you about targets this receptor HER2 and about the time that this work was being developed in esophageal cancer with Herceptin and HER2 uh, we were developing some research targeting a very closely related receptor known as EGFR or the epidermal growth factor receptor. And we were investigating these for a drug called gefitinib. It was a targeted drug. It targets EGFR. It's taken as an oral medicine. It has few side effects. It's an outpatient treatment. Uh, But we decided to take a slightly different tack to that which had been adopted with Aceptin. We decided to try and treat patients that had developed resistance to chemotherapy. And the reason we did this uh, was because back in 2007, when we began this research, there were no treatments available for patients whose cancers had developed resistance to chemotherapy. What this meant was that we could treat them supportively only, and so again, the the tumours would develop rapidly, and the life expectancy of these patients was very short, just a few months. So we decided to address this by performing the cold clinical trial, and this was the first time a clinical trial had been performed in patients whose esophageal cancers had had developed resistance to chemotherapy. And I did this together with David Therry, who at the time was the Professor of Oncology at Birmingham University. So in this trial, after patients had progressed uh, on chemotherapy, they were randomised to treatment with the drug, gefitinib, uh, or a placebo. And the fact that it was ethical for us to randomise patients to a placebo treatment tells you there was no treatment options available for these patients. What we saw early on in the trial was that in some patients there was a very rapid, a dramatic and a durable response to the gefitinib, such as the example shown on the slide. What this meant was that patients who were very ill towards the end of their life Uh, responded to the treatment, their symptoms improved, they regained their quality of life. And when they did response, these responses lasted typically for between uh, one and two years. But the difficulty was that these responses occurred in only 10% of patients. 90% of the time, when we gave gefitinib, it didn't work. And so we knew that what we had to do was develop a predictive biomarker test to identify the patients that were going to respond to uh, gefitinib. And the test we developed was a FISH test. And what we were able to show was that those patients that had increased copy numbers of the gene that codes for the protein that the drug targets were the patients that benefited from the gefitinib drug. Those patients with normal copies did not benefit. 
So this was a predictive biomarker test. And this work really has allowed us in a short period of time to make significant progress. So back in 2007, we moved from a situation where there was no treatment available for this group of patients to performing the first trial, to finding a responsive subgroup of patients, uh, to uh, identifying a biomarker to direct the use of that drug in that patient. In essence, taking an untreatable medical condition and converting it into a treatable uh, disease. But really, I would suggest you that, that this is really just the start of this process. And, and the way we view this in my group is that this is really just a foot in the door. We want to do better. We want to uh, use this to identify more effective treatments. And this is the trial we're planning next. So uh, what happens is that patients who've progressed after chemotherapy have the FISH test. If it's positive, uh, they get treatment with an EGFR inhibitor. And whilst at the time gefitinib was the best drug of this class, we now have more effective medicines. And the drug that we're aiming to test is one of these. Uh, it's known as an antibody drug, drug conjugate. It's an antibody against EGFR, so it hits the receptor, but it also is linked to a chemotherapy drug, so it brings the drug where it's needed, a double hit, if you like. And we, we're optimistic that this may pr prove to be a more effective targeted treatment for this group of patients. But we're also developing this as an umbrella protocol. So we'll be identifying patients who are negative for the biomarker, and we have the opportunity then to develop other innovative treatment approaches for these patients and develop a, a precision oncology approach for esophageal cancer. We also want to take these clinical observations, as I mentioned, back into the laboratory. Uh, and this is work that I've begun in my new post in Dundee. We want to understand the mechanism uh, in a lot of detail why patients with the increased copy number of this gene, why do they respond to treatment? What is the underlying reason? And to do this, we need cell lines. Uh, and this is work I'm developing with Dr. Gillian Smith in the School of Medicine, Professor Angus Lamont in the School of Life Sciences. And it's work also that's being supported by the Nine Miles Cancer Campaign in the form of a PhD student, Marvin Shuttleworth. So this is the, really the stage that we've got to at the moment in treating this disease. We've defined two molecular subgroups, the EGFR positive one that our work has uh, defined and the HER2 positive one as well. And together, these account for about a quarter of the patients. And this is good, but what about the other 75%? Well, the, given our success targeting these two receptors, the obvious first place to look was at these other receptors that were closely related. Uh, and here the uh, hypothesis was that just as we'd seen before, could uh, in having increased copy numbers of the genes of these receptors mean that these patients would respond well to drugs targeting their receptors? If this was the case, we thought we had perhaps started at least to open the floodgates for effective treatment of the disease. Unfortunately, it was never going to be that simple, uh, and alas, uh, these two receptors appear to be the exceptions to the rule. The trials targeting these other receptors have unfortunately been negative. So where does this leave us? Well, I think it, where it does leave us is that we're at the stage of investigation where we do need to move back into the lab from the clinic, take these observations, and look at them in the lab. And in this regard, I think that a key biological feature that we've noted that we think is important is that esophageal cancers have very high levels of genetic, genomic instability. And so you can see this. If you see in a normal cell here, this is the a normal chromosome smear, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes all identical, matched up. And you can see just with a quick glance in the esophageal cancer cell, this is very abnormal. Uh, we have extra copies of many chromosomes, bits missing, bits changed over, uh, a lot of rearrangement. And this is a consequence of the instability. And what we've also noted is that in the change from normal esophageal cells to cancer, there is the abrupt development of genomic instability. And this occurs between one and two years prior to when cancers are diagnosed. And this genomic instability is the underlying cause of the copy number gain of genes, which we know is important and which we know we can target with medicines. So I think what we need to do is we need to understand very precisely what are the mechanisms of genomic instability in esophageal cancer. Unfortunately, in Dundee, we have a number of leading scientists who are experts in studying the mechanisms by which normal cells maintain the stability of their genome. 
uh, and how these might go wrong in cancer. So what I've done, or what I've been doing in the, the, the year that I've been here is establishing collaborations with these people so that we can focus their expertise very specifically on esophageal cancer. And the reason I think this is important is because just as human beings evolve, tumours also evolve. And uh, if we look at a tumour, we can see it's comprised of many different populations of cells or subclones, all of which have different characteristics. And we can draw this, uh, if you like, this evolution of tumours as a tree, where each of the branches are different populations of tumour cells that have different uh, characteristics. And so when we treat cancer at the moment, what we're really doing is we're pruning. We're taking out and eliminating those clones that are sensitive uh, to the drugs. Uh, uh, but we're leaving behind many other populations of cells that are resistant and will regrow the tumour. So if we can target the mechanisms of genomic instability, what we think we can do is we can limit the diversity uh, that develops, and the result would be a much more spindly, if you like, weaker tumour, which will be easier to pick off with our targeted medicines. And if we combine these approach with clinical screening strategies, we think it may be possible to prevent the development of the cancer altogether. So this is the process, really, I've talked about, of going from genes to proteins to cell to patients. To target this, we need, with medicines, we need to know the proteins that are important. And this presents us with a bit of a challenge, uh, because whilst the technology has existed for really a couple of decades to study the genetic complexity of cancer, the technology to study the complexity of the protein biochemistry of cancer has really lagged behind in its development. Fortunately, things have changed, and a new technique has emerged called mass spectrometry-based quantitative proteomics, and this allows the analysis of all the many thousands of proteins within a cell in a single experiment, and how they interact with each other and how they're modified chemically. Uh, this is the mass spectrometry facility in the School of Life Sciences here in Dundee, and together with Professor Mike Ferguson and Angus Lamont, we've now developed the meth methodology to use this mass spec quantitative proteomics technique in esophageal cancer. So this should allow us to, uh, to identify, to dissect out which proteins are important from the many thousands that are in cancer cells. The next step is then to show that these proteins change the behaviour of cancer cells. And to do this, we've been working with the UK National Phenotypic Screening Centre, which is based in Dundee. Uh, and this is a robotic laboratory, and this allows the, if you like, the behaviour, the phenotype of many hundreds of cells under many hundreds of conditions to be examined in a single experiment at a sin single point. And this is important because experiments that would otherwise have taken months, if not years, can be performed in a matter of days and weeks. And so this will greatly accelerate our ability to examine the behaviour uh, of cancer cells. But to translate it into patients, we need medicines. Uh, and this is where, fortunately, the drug, Dundee Drug Discovery Unit comes in. So this highly successful unit has all the expertise and capability you might expect to find in a pharmaceutical uh, company based in the university. And what it means is that once we know the proteins we need to target, the Drug Discovery Unit can help us develop the medicines to target these proteins. And this will then be something that we will show will change the behaviour of esophageal cancer cells and subject to clinical trials will show us that it will be able to change the behaviour of cancer, uh, cancer within, uh, within patients. So this is the journey I said that translational cancer research involves. It's moving from genes to proteins to cells to patients. And I think that it's a journey that we can complete in Dundee, but it does require us to work collaboratively. It does require clinicians and scientists to work together and to work across traditional academic and clinic di clinical disciplines. This is what I'm trying to do in this post, uh, and I think that if we are able to achieve this and focus our research efforts on hard-to-treat cancers, we will be able to develop the medicines that patients with these diseases need and which they deserve. If we do this, then I think that we will have gone a long way to achieving what might have previously thought to be impossible. Finally in the talk, I'd just like to finish. Along the way, I've uh, talked a lot 
uh, about the collaborators. I've shown some my collaborators. I've shown some photographs. Uh, I'd like to also uh, share with you some of my patients who are also my partners, my collaborators in this research. These are amongst the most courageous people that anyone will ever meet. I'm always admired by how they're willing to take part in clinical trials, often knowing that there is very little chance that it will benefit them, but knowing with certainty that it will benefit patients that come after them. I owe a lot to these people. Many of them have also transformed into very strong advocates for heart to treat cancers, enabling us to mobilise our and, and increase our research efforts. And many of them have also proven to be very effective fundraisers as well. But the final word uh, in the presentation today I'd like to give to my family, uh, because whilst this work is my passion, it is my vocation perhaps, uh, I could not achieve it, I could not do it without the love and the support of these three people here, Charlotte, Julia and Lawrence. Uh, every day they remind me, they keep my feet on the ground, they remind me what life is really about and this is the inspiration that I need to perform this work. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll now hand you back, I think, to the principal. Thank you, Russell. Um, uh, the university's um, core purpose that we defined a few years ago is to transform lives, and I think you've seen a great example there of how um, working together, and particularly across disciplines, we can do that. Um, now, Russell is um, uh, prepared to answer questions from the audience, and I'm going to ask Gary Myers, the, uh, uh, the dean of, of the School of Medicine here in the, the university, uh, to, um, to chair this part of the session and then to give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Pete, um, and thank you, Russell, for a, for a truly inspirational lecture and for talking to us about your work, past, present, and future. I think we were, we were delighted when a year ago, exactly, really, you, you, you agreed to join us here in Dundee, and I think your lecture today is a testament to the reasons why we're very keen to, to recruit you to Dundee. I, th I think we see you as being key to the future of uh, translational cancer research in Dundee, and you talked about the collaborators that enable you, you to do that, and I think it's likely you're going to have an impact right across the range from basic science understanding right the way through to, to treatment, and we look forward to seeing that, that work roll out. So, as the principal said, uh, Russell's prepared to take some questions, and I'm sure there are, there are quite a few, so if we can open the floor to any questions just now. excellent point. Um, uh, we have a policy of being open about our research, so all, all our data is, is open access, so anyone can, can access it. But we, we also uh, work together in uh, Scottish-wide, UK-wide, and uh, international groups. So, for example, the, the trial I spoke about today, the COG trial, uh, we have a network of 50 investigators uh, that we lead uh, across uh, England and Scotland uh, to to allow us to perform that work. And, and that COG network also sits within a larger UK body, which is known as the National Cancer Research Network, uh, which uh, it provides a forum for, for sharing work, uh, for developing new trial ideas in the setting of peer review. Without that, outside that, there probably isn't yet a global organisation, but there is a Europe-wide organisation. So this is known as the EORTC, the European Organisation for the Research and Treatment of Cancer. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Gastric and Esophageal Cancer Task Force. Uh, we work to, to undertake trials uh, across Europe. Uh, and I've moved the focus of that through my involvement towards this kind of translational research. Uh, and so next year in Dundee, we are having what will be the first EORTC uh, translational research meeting in gastrointestinal cancer. 
So this is an example of really bringing scientists together across Europe with clinicians to do exactly what you suggest. So I agree entirely, um, and it's important. And thank you for allowing me to highlight uh, those, those networks. Great talk, Russell, thank you. These hard to treat cancers, um, do they share a common feature of having particularly fast growth, or do they share a common feature of actually only clinically presenting late so that you've already got metastasis and spread? Yeah. And if it's the latter, is there also work about trying to get early detection through yeah. through biomarkers? Yeah, I think it's it's both. That's the it's it's a late presentation. Uh, and with dissemination almost invariable at the time of symptomatic presentation compared, uh, combined with um, rapid growth. And high levels of genomic instability are, are what really fuels that rapid growth. So I think that there is a need to, uh, to develop effective treatments but also uh, align those with preventative strategies. So I think that this, you know, this, this is perhaps where by targeting genomic instability to could have the most impact if we combine it with clinical screening strategies. Um, and uh, I think that what the data suggests to us at the, at the moment is that this abrupt development of genomic instability occurs at a very early stage. So the cells will look macroscopically and, uh, and, and microscopically normal, but you can detect uh, the phenotype of instability within them, so um, you know, so molecularly, so being able to pick that up in screening and target it could be, could be the key impact of this work. Thanks, Russell. Um, what's funny about the um, thing that kicks all of this off? Is it, is it larger things like smoking or alcohol? Or yeah, it yeah, it, it's not smoking. <laughs> it's not smoking. Uh, it's. It, the epidemiology is complex. It is linked to um, body weight. Uh, it is linked to being a man. The incidence of esophageal cancer is esophageal cancer is five times more common in men than women. Nobody knows why, but that's a clear signal. It's also linked to something which is very common, and that's the reflux of acid from the stomach into the esophagus. But the problem is that this is something that 40 or 50 percent of adults have, but a tiny fraction of people develop cancer. So we can't lay this one on smoking, but we probably can lay it on body weight. But body weight seems to be a marker for uh, visceral fat. So this is perhaps why men get it, because the, it's the classic beer belly look. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's an interesting question. I suppose that you're, you're asked, this is an example where HER2 was originally useful as a target in breast cancer, and we've now shown it's, it's been useful as a target in esophageal cancer. Again, this is probably the exception rather than the rule. Um, it seems to be very rare for targets uh, to translate from one cancer type to the other. Um, there were very few other examples. So I think that it, that it may be difficult to, uh, to, to, to translate one target into other tumour types. Um, and I think we kind of saw that with, with the target in the receptor tyrosine kinases because we thought, as I, as I suggested, we thought that we were opening the floodgates. And many of those other receptor tyrosine kinases you know, have been useful targets in other tumour types but not in esophageal cancer. Okay. Um, oh, yep, sorry, yep. Oh, the, the killer question. At the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I thought I got away without answering that one. Uh, we don't know yet. That, I mean, this, this is why I am relying on collaboration with all those scientists that I showed on the uh, slide. Um, who are the experts in 
those mechanisms at the very sort of detailed uh, DNA repair level, if you like. So th that's the key question. If we know which mechanisms are important in esophageal cancer, and it may be that different mechanisms are important in different patients. If we're able to do that, then that, that, that would be a key step forward. But that's the work of a decade, I think. OK, so that killer question, we'll let you off the hook in terms of any more. Um, so, so Russell wouldn't be here today if, if it wasn't for the generosity of the, the Nine Wars Cancer Campaign. And as, as the principal said in the introduction, uh, really largely as a result of the, the, the memorial um, fundraising campaign for Jackie Wood, which raised £2 million to recruit um, cancer scientists uh, and support them within the local area. So it's absolutely uh, appropriate and an honour to introduce um, Lady Fiona um, Oh, um, sorry, Jess. <laughs> um, lost my uh, train of thought there. So, probably a lady, Fiona Fraser, um, from the Iowa's Cancer Campaign, to come and, and say a few words. Thank you very much indeed. It's a very great pleasure for me to stand here today in front of so many people and to say that this last appeal has been completed. Very successfully, we raised in excess of £2 million that we had anticipated. Lovely to have the cheque today that finally took us to yet that other step forward. And it's a great pleasure to be here um, in the presence of Jackie's family and Russell's family. To, to meet all of you today is, is a great pleasure, and you should be very proud of your son. But I would just like to say I think it's been a very fitting tribute to Jackie who worked so hard over so many years that this is now complete. And I hope you can all see that we're ready for the next step forward. The dream we'd always had of making the Nine Wells Cancer Campaign, um, getting it to bring everybody together on one site. We managed to do that and I think after a fairly short time we're noticing the difference of having all people together on one site. <coughs> I think as well, many of you will have been to many lectures probably over the years. I think it's the one thing those of us connected with the Nine Wells Cancer Campaign always feel very privileged, that we are able to meet people like Russell and all the other scientists and clinical um, scientists and oncologists. And we are very privileged to hear of the progress that is being made. And I think you would agree that over the last 20 years, the, how much the language has changed. You know, hearing Russell speak today... Um, I thought was inspirational and we're talking about targeting and personalised and that, that is something that we just didn't talk about you know, 20 years ago so I hope you are all um, enthused and um, supportive of the work that Russell's doing because we certainly intend to continue to support him and we feel very privileged to do that I should say really that the, uh, the importance of the appeal that we did run um, the building is the thing that's standing there. But, of course, the building, the Jackie Wood Cancer Centre, very important. But the most important thing, of course, is the work, as we've heard, that's going on there um, inside the centre. To think that it's now built up to 150 scientists working there is quite incredible. It's quite incredible. And I think for all of us who have supported it, we will certainly be continuing to support it in the future. And I would just like to say a few changes with the Nine Wells Cancer Campaign. Bessie Henderson, who was sitting at the back over there, been our secretary for many years, many will know, um, she retired, and we are now being very efficiently run by the administrative side, by the development office at the university, and we're very grateful to that. But as far as the actual day-to-day -day running of the Nine Wells Cancer Campaign, it continues as before. It's volunteer-led, um, a lot of very enthusiastic people, um, fundraising in all sorts of spheres, as you heard earlier, from large donations from charitable trusts to events to organisations to things like Robin today. And we hope that will definitely continue. And I think the benefit of now having the Jackie Wood Cancer Centre is um, that we now have a focus for any future fundraising. You never need to worry. If you would like to give money, uh, you know it's going to go to Dundee. It's going to be happening locally and it's going to be excellent. So I'm sure Russell's lecture this afternoon will have assured you that any money that you do raise in the future will be very well spent. I'm very conscious that there are a lot of people in this audience who have supported us over many, many years, and I would like to say to you all how grateful we are for that. Um, we all become part of a, 
a family here, I think. I think it's the benefit of being a smaller university, perhaps. Um, we have this public interface with the scientists here. So I would just like to thank you all for being here today. Thank you for your past uh, support, and thank you in anticipation of your future support. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>